So I'm Liz Tupper. Um, I have over 20 years experience working in social good, internet of things, web, mobile applications in the video game industry. Um, I had my own video game startup called Scient over a decade ago um, and was recently lead role as, uh, in the lead role as chief product and operations officer at a local startup called Social Impact. Uh, technologies, SID Technologies. Um, I worked at SmartThings through uh, Samsung acquisition and worked alongside many startups while at Software for Good. I volunteer my time with an organization called Amplify, where we help amplify people who are changing the world for good. Um, and I started my career as a self-taught web developer. So today we're going to start. We're going to talk about the Minnesota startup ecosystem white paper project, a passion project of mine, um, that I'm excited to share with you all today. Um, and to get started, um, I want to talk about you know, entrepreneurship is hard. Um, and you know, we heard from the spirit in the the session zero today that um, you know there's lots of conversations that happen with entrepreneurship. Um, that don't happen anywhere else but here at Minibar in these one-on-one -on -one intimate conversations. So I'm really hoping today that we can, I can talk through this and then we can talk and share and, um, and have questions at the end of this. Um, but to get back to the slides, entrepreneurship is hard and for people without a clear pathway to funding, it's even harder. Sometimes well-intended help, support, and feedback isn't helpful and in some cases it's harmful. If you are on the receiving end of this feedback, you may or may not be comfortable speaking up. Um, and you don't want to risk funding, mem mentorship, or other opportunities. And so the, the cycle repeats itself over and over again. And there's a lot of things that have changed in this Minnesota startup ecosystem in the last 10 years, which shows that we are open to trying new things and growing and learning. So how do we spotlight the areas for improvement while creating a safe space for feedback? So this is where the Minnesota Startup Ecosystem White Paper Project comes in. Our goal is to create valuable feedback cycles that will positively impact founders, mentors, funders, supporters looking to grow our economy, our ecosystem and economy. So I want to go back. I want to go back to all these slides and provide a little bit more com like commentary. This is the director's cut. Um, and so, you know, entrepreneurship is hard. It's hard across the board. It's, it's hard for anyone, but especially for those who are pre-seed, pre-funding, um, you know, don't have any revenue or customers. It's especially hard, especially if you have very little or no savings. There's no opportunity for you to do friends and family round. And there's a ton of other barriers that we're going to get to in a little bit. Um, so when you, when you start building your company, time is the most valuable resource. Your time as a founder, your team's time. And Daniel Steer of Lunar Startups recently posted on LinkedIn um, about how when she was designing Lunar, she, she remembered seeing a study that was going around about um, how many cup of, cups of coffee it took for individuals to find someone who could be like a steward or really move the needle for their business. The respondents were mostly white and male, and the average answer was six cups of coffee. Well, Daniel, Daniel then went on and decided to do a survey of her own, and the answer that she got was 36 cups of coffee. Now, if you think about 36 cups of coffee, that's a lot of time. So like that coffee, you know, on average, if it's an hour and then you had to commute there and then there was the follow up afterwards, let alone the networking that you had to do to get that coffee in the first place, all that time could have been spent putting back into your business. And so this, you know, this was just one of many examples of what we see, especially for founders who are black, brown, people of color, indigenous, women, LGBTQIA+. Um, and <sighs> these founders are consistently over-mentored, over-coffeed, right? And under-invested in, right? They can't get to that seed round. They're pre-seed. They can't get the dollars. 
So mentors can share personal experiences and lessons learned, but, while, but that mentorship may not be super relevant if you aren't facing the same barriers or, as me or the individual that you're talking to. And so Daniel suggested that in order for more people and more ideas to thrive in Minnesota, we need to expand our region's capacity for sponsoring founders. And, and uh, it's our community's ability to sort of show up for emerging startups for discrete tasks and specific connections, both big and small. Recently, this was like in the last two weeks, I was having uh, virtual coffee with someone. And they were like, hey, you should join this, this group. We have this amazing group that connects people. And I was like, does it have a paid membership? And they're like, yeah, but it's only, it's only like 1,500 a year. And you get, this, you get this exclusive network with this person. It's been phenomenal. I'm like, yeah, I don't do exclusive memberships to anyone. I have a policy that I don't do that because it just creates unnecessary barriers for people who don't have that. And they're like, oh, but we do, we do sponsorships. I was like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So um, a couple of other ideas that Daniel had is like, if your company offers mentorship or pro bono volunteering to underinvested, underinvested entrepreneurs, advocate that they also provide grants or become customers to those entrepreneurs. Find advocates for startups that are not in your network. So start looking for startups that you can support, actively looking outside of your network, outside of the people that you know, and become a customer. So back on the feedback and how it can be really harmful. So I find, and, and a lot of these conversations are from, you know, either me observing it as a founder, me observing it in, inside a company of, of uh, a female-led company with a black immigrant founder that sometimes the feedback seems performative, right? Like, are, are, you, are you showing up to talk to me because you generally want me to succeed? Or are you trying to take a piece of what I've got going on and you just want to be a part of that? So, you know, that big time suck of that performative, sort of harmful, lead you down the wrong direction feedback um, is not what we need. And what we, and what we actually need and what we want is to just build our company. And so there's, you know, the sort of the impetus of this project and why it came about um, is over 10 years I had this video game startup. We're super successful in terms of we were written up in video game magazines all over the world. I was on the primetime Fox 9 News. I was on the front page of the Star Tribune business section. I was in the Minnesota Cup, and I was in an a incubator called Project Skyway. We could not raise a single dime here. But a lot's changed. There's way more incubators. There's way more accelerators. There's way more funds here. But if you listen to founders who haven't reached that barrier, the problems are the same. And in fact, in some cases, they've gotten worse. And so what I'm hoping to do with this white paper is to give this as a source for people to connect, share their stories in a way that this can be surfaced up where, I'm, where they don't receive harm, where they don't receive backlash for their organization. The Minnesota Chamber Foundation also had a report come out recently, and it talked about how um, Minnesota startups raise a record $1.5 billion in 2020. A record 175 venture capital deals in 2021. And this, then there was a relatively small subset of businesses that were um, new businesses, disapproached disappropriately, <laughs> fortunately, thanks, that's the word, um, driving innovation job and job creation and output here. And they went on to say that most new businesses in the U.S. fail to make it past the fifth year. But the inverse was true here in Minnesota, however, with over half of all businesses clearing that threshold. 
So we're proven here that we're fantastic innovators and we can beat the odds. Um, early stage funding also remains a barrier, which I talked about. Um, for even the most innovative new startups, even though we've proven as a state that we have a track record in innovation, and this is particularly true for founders who access, lack access to all those resources that I talked about, referral networks, money, um, that can help them get that attention and trust of investors and um, increasing the number of local startups. Um, and then finally, while the Minnesota startup ecosystem is gaining steam, it faces challenges related to sustaining awareness and support amidst the multitude of priorities um, and, it's our, and our collective attention as a state. And entrepreneurs are, they also went on to say that entrepreneurs are also un, unaware of resources that exist to support them. And while I would say that might be true, there may be a resources that are aware, it's their time. It's this sort of chasing down uh, feedback that's sort of limiting to them to do that. Um, so there's this huge opportunity. We're super successful as a state. We've got all these great ideas. And so what do we do now? So here's my plan. Um, with this white paper project, what I'm hoping to do is I'm creating a survey. And that survey will lead to doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with founders. We're gonna, that's going to turn into writing a white paper to highlight the things we're doing well as a startup community and the things that we need to approve. My target goal is to interview, or someone else within my support network, interview 20 to 40 people. We're going to pay them for their time. I do not believe in exploiting individuals for their stories. And uh, I believe that uh, there's no such thing as free labor. There's a cost to everything. And so. Ideally, this feedback that will be received will provide specific ways for individuals and organizations to adjust their contributions to the com community in a way that truly adds value, ultimately creating more opportunities for investments and job creation here in Minnesota. Uh, for organizations, the plan is to put together a commitment pledge um, for and programs to track progress and impact over time. I don't want this to turn into a diversity and inclusion pledge that people put out once and they're never held accountable for what they said they were willing to do. So the plan is to have um, sort of a report put together so that organizations need to continue to report out at the six month, the 12 month, and the 18 month what they did um, to support the pledge that they agreed to meet. These are my current supporters and partners on this project. Um, Ari Odaya, who I worked with at SID Technologies, Gario Harrison and Mick White, part of the Amplify team, Angel Even, who is an entrepreneur herself who helps pre-seed entrepreneurs navigate uh, the startup landscape here, Judd Grutman, who is an entrepreneur himself with Vanzella, and Mondo Davis, also known as the Black tech guy. Um, so I'm not doing this alone. I'm very aware that I am a white woman sitting up here talking about helping um, any founders that don't have a clear pathway of funding, which includes people that don't look like me. Um, but I'm also aware that I have the power to push this forward, and I'm not worried about my reputation getting ruined. Um, and so I'm really grateful for this. I would love to see my current supporters and partners grow and expand. Um, so how you can help, um, I want to connect with founders that can share your founder's story. Like I mentioned, I'm, I'm either looking to raise money or I'm actually probably, to get this started, going to self-fund this. Um, I love for you to connect me with other founders. And if you have money, please fund the project. Um, and once again, the founders that I really want to connect with those that are underrepresented and underfunded, black, brown, indigenous, people of color, immigrants, LGBTQIA+, those living with disabilities, women, and other intersectionalities that have been marginalized. Um, and there's some QR codes. So I have an interest form that you all can fill out depending on, it's a, a multi-select. 
So you can get on some email lists that I'm going to get set up and communication lists. And then there's my contact information to connect with me. But I would love it if um, we could open this up now to thoughts you all have, conversations. Oh, I should share this too. Um, I'm tentatively planning on, we'll see, we'll see if it happens, um, doing a follow-up session at Startup Week in September. And I would really love, if the white paper is out, to do a community healing session on the results of that white paper um, so that we can acknowledge that and then start moving forward as a community. So questions, thoughts? It's all startups. So like obviously technology, my background, right? It's, a, it's every startup that I've been involved in. But it, no, it's not just limited to tech startups. But when I've, what I've found from like just jumping industries within tech is that entrepreneurship and the problems that we face as like leaders is the same for the most part from industry to industry. So um, I think in the CPG space, yeah, I would love I would love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so are you publishing the information like uh, for the, to the organizations, or are you put out like a, a white paper to like, circulate on? Yeah. And so I guess another, another follow up question too: Have you thought about interviewing the reverse to try to understand because there might be yeah something you could learn by interviewing the ecosystem? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So, um, so the white paper itself is mostly going to be anonymized feedback. If feedback comes through for specific like accelerators or or group fellowships or what have you, um, th there's an option to. I've been thinking about an option to. We would be able to provide your results, but you're you're going to pay money for that, and that money is going to go back to the founders that shared that story. Um, I am super open to uh, hearing the other side of the story once this information gets out. I don't want to, like, there's a, there's a sort of a, a power difference between those who hold the cards and have the purse strings and can provide the mentorship and those who are seeking it. And I want the individuals who have less power today to get the first voice and get the first crack at that. And then future discussions can turn into, OK, here are the challenges we're facing. How can we remove those? Or how can we adjust that so that we can meet everyone sort of either in the middle or make improvements? So yeah, I'm super open to it, but that'll come later. So you obviously have had some experience looking for funding and have been less successful than what are the top three reasons that People don't take me seriously because I look like I do. One, I, I enter so many conversations where people don't. Have you gotten that feedback? Or is your perception of the reason? Both. Both. Um, I think, yeah, both. Both. I, I've got, definitely gotten this like, oh, I'm, I'm totally surprised by you after I talk or after I present information. So um, yeah, it's for sure both. Uh, you know, I think some um, other challenges is that whole like making the, the like pre-seed jump. So here's, here's another anecdote. Um, a lot of organizations, especially for underfunded and underrepresented founders, seek funding elsewhere first, and then Minnesota is willing to fund. It's a, like if people start looking at those numbers a little bit more, they will find that. So the last startup that I was a part of um, started in 2019 and didn't start making traction here in Minnesota until MIT backed us. So we had to leave the state in order for us to start getting attention. And so, you know, even though we're super innovative, there is this risk with our dollars here for some reason, which is really interesting to me because that risk does not happen in the nonprofit space. Give to the Max State comes out and we throw our money out like crazy. I'm not gonna say that word, like ridiculously throw our money out. But we can't do that same thing 
with startups. And it just sort of boggles my mind because it's, it's really the same thought process in your head, but for some reason you're okay giving your money to nonprofits and doing it, but you're not okay giving it directly to the people who need the support. So connect with me on the interest form if you're super interested. I'm gonna be posting stuff on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, more about this program as we get started. Um, and get rolling with this. I really appreciate you just showing up and listening to the conversation so we can get this started. Uh, and I'd love to connect with anyone one on one if you want to talk more individually. Yeah. Hey, um, I'm Ben. I'm with the Forge North Coalition looking at the startup world in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And you are, I don't want to take up too much space in the room as someone who hasn't experienced these barriers. But like what you are saying and what our founder survey from last year shows is we're speaking the same language and uh, people like Maria Plessel, who is you know, the executive director of Ministar, have been leading some really important work in collaboration with folks like Connect Up, like Minnesota Cup, uh, Elaine Rasmussen, Jess Bird, to try and you know, understand founders' perspectives, take action on this work. Uh, Michaela Rosard from Groove Capital, on Thursday hosted a phenomenal event uh, airing some of the issues that you're addressing to angel investors. So I'm not here saying that we have solved this problem. It is still urgent. Liz's work is still important and will help you know, our whole ecosystem. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm here because I wanted to hear it firsthand and learn more about how we're showing up to support. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Cool. With that said, we can end early. You all can, uh, oh, Steve, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, is this modeled after any other sort of web papers you've seen in other states or efforts? No, it's all in my head. <laughs> I mean, like, I definitely, so what this is modeled after is the work that I do on the product side of building software. Like, how do I, how do I, take a really human-centered approach to figuring out how to build software that has the greatest impact, and it's going out and talking to people. So it's, it's, it's modeled after using that human-centered design approach to survey, meet people, identify things. And there's going to be things that I find out that are a shock, that are a surprise to me. There's going to be validation of things I already know. Um, and to, like you pointed out, there might be pockets in different industries where things are just different. Um, and I'm hoping that this sort of bubbles all of that to the top. And, it, and by no way is this done, right? Like 20 to 40 people talking to them is not enough, right? There's, it's just the start of the conversation. But I want to have the conversation. And I want organizations like Forge North and others to come on board um, and for us all to be working towards this together. Yeah. Uh, I'm Ryan Weber with Free North Ventures. Um, I was an entrepreneur of a bootstrap company and then started a fund. But I, I, just, I was in DC last week for the Beyond Silicon Valley event, which is Rise of Us. And uh, we're actually incubating a couple of companies. One of the CEOs here, which is Derek at Back Off Brand. And we're raising, we invest in our startups, so we're in a very fortunate position with a fund. But we're also raising outside capital at the various stages. And I've been I'm really shocked myself at how hard it is, even if you have experience and a strong team, and even you know all the fun behind you. The early stage is really tough. Mm -hmm. Like once you get the seed funds and first check funds are still really tough to get in front of. It's still really tough to fundraise for anybody. Yeah. And I couldn't believe last week how cons I met 30 fund managers quality time. There were 150 at the event all around the country, and I don't think it's easy to raise this round for anybody. You know, and I think the angel, I was an angel investor for 11 years while I was running my own business. And, you know, it's even, I think, I think it's, um, it takes a lot of trust, you know, to, to get someone to part with some cash. And unless you build interest from customers, you know, it's, it's one way. But there are some techniques. I think that there are, there are ways to improve your chances of fundraising in the pre-seed and early stage, but it's certainly, I can only imagine it's, it's, it's obviously 
I'm you know in a pretty good position, you know, privileged position or have a lot of access, but it's um, it's not easy even you know for any. I don't think for anybody, but it, it can only be impossible, you know, seem impossible. Right. But I think the other, I don't know, our state is. I think we as the Inkling Islanders, we're doing. I'm actually a participant in doing a Greater Minnesota Angel monthly angel network meeting to try to create more connections for founders around Greater Minnesota. Um, and I think part of this is you know, finding people that are the right type of investor. Like if their interests align with your, what you're doing, you're going to increase your potential. But we, we haven't had, I think in some communities there might be a more, could, I mean I really believe, like having scaled the company in St. Cloud a lot of friends in Greater Minnesota in particular, like the network we had was not as good as other states, like yep. in, in connecting people to money. Yep. And um, but it's really interesting. Um, I really think that we can do better, and I'm excited to hear about you know the initiatives being taken to try to improve that because I think it is probably where we have the most biggest gap, like you know, in capital. Yeah, yeah, and you know the. Totally, and I, like, I, I, you know, I think having like better, better frameworks in place for crowdsourcing is an opportunity, and like no strings attached funding, like especially in that pre-seed round, like could you give five, ten thousand dollars just so that like I can stay focused on my business plan or building out my team, um, so that then I can then go down this other path but like like being okay with um as a funder of like maybe the only the only thing that i get out of this is i get to see someone else grow economic wealth for themselves and their family and i don't get anything back in return or a, or a zero interest loan or a really low interest loan to get you started because i think there's this whole other set of barriers that you don't want to get in too soon with people who have deep pockets because you don't want it to change your business or have your business sort of be taken over by all these other ideas. I'm a small business, and my biggest challenge I've seen is to ask the investor or, or lender will ask, can I see your um, the tax return? But I don't have much on my tax return. What can I show you? you know? yeah. And if I don't have much to show it, and then they're like, oh, we can't give you money because there's not much there. Yeah, yeah. It makes that, that portion of it very difficult as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh gosh, we got more questions over here. Yeah, um, we'll go with you in the black and then the hat and then the yellow. Sure, so uh, do you think that the uh, projected economic downturn, you mentioned that uh, in Minnesota, that seed stage especially, is kind of difficult to overcome. Yeah. And a lot of companies now are experiencing down rounds. Do you think that's gonna play more into it as far as uh, we need to uh, try to deploy these resources a little bit more? Or yeah, you know, I think from what I've seen, um, and I, like I've I've lived here my entire life, but um, there's so much amazing talent. And if you if you're a founder, that well, well I'll just put it this way: having my startup, even though it failed, completely changed my career trajectory. Completely changed it. Like I had. I hand, I've hand selected every single job I've had since I had that startup. And so if you're a, someone who has the initiative to have this idea and then start acting on it, and then if you can stick it out, even if you can just stick it out for a year, there is so much hope and talent in that individual that like even if that thing fails, they're going to be successful. That's like I, I believe very strongly that if you are willing to take that step, you are worth investing money in, regardless. Um, you know, and I can't I can't necessarily speak to like obviously COVID changed everything. It changed how people do business. We've got the great resignation. It, it gave people downtime to think about what they really wanted to be doing with their lives. I'm not quite sure how economies are going to change, but I am really hopeful and care about this community. And if we can do what we do for nonprofits at Give the Max Day, there's no reason why we can't do that, Give the Max Day for startups and small businesses. We've got so much money here in the state and in pockets, and there's, and there's no reason that we can't 
distributed a little bit differently than we than we have. So I know that didn't fully answer your question, but those are just some thoughts that I had. The hat. I'm curious. You spoke to the idea of like no strings attached to testing. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen examples anywhere nationally, perhaps, of a successful model of a no strings attached investment? Or have you had investors? I haven't. Um, you know, that's like we have a long term plan at Amplify to create that model. Um, so, right now at Amplify, we host um, monthly virtual sessions where we amplify a featured founder. Um, they're really great. I'd recommend checking them out. Um, it's amplify100.com um, on LinkedIn as well. That's a way to like match you with a network that could be a, a customer, or a potential funder, or anything. But we have long-term aspirations to become our own new model of a VC fund. Um, I'm sure there are models of it. I just don't know any that exist right now. So, yellow in the back. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I, I apologize. I stepped in late. So this is. It's actually a white paper project that I'm working on to sort of surface up the state of um, startups, especially underfunded and underrepresented startups. So, so one thing I'm seeing reflected right now is a lot of people that at one point would have been venture capital. Everybody's assessing their risk at yeah. this point. Yeah. So even if you had money to invest over here, you're taking a hit over here, and I need to reassess my risk. So one of the risk components that I'm curious whether or not you're hearing from people yeah. is a risk component that's looked at a lot more now is, okay, startup, cool idea, maybe it's investable, what's your plan for attracting the talent to grow this? Because yeah. that's an asset that at one time was easier to find, yeah. is getting a lot harder to find. Yeah. And from the perspective of money, how are you gonna solve that? Yeah, I think that varies based on what the, the, the startup is, the talent that they need to bring on board. Um, the startup that I was recently with, we had no problem finding a CTO to come on pro bono for equity. We posted a job on LinkedIn and we had uh, over 80 applicants in four days, many with existing patents and PhDs to join the organization. And so I think it, it kind of depends. Like I'm not just looking at entrepreneurship in the tech space, I'm looking at it across the board. Um, I'm, I'm also, you know, while I think there, there's an opportunity for firms that are looking to also make their money back or also to make inv an investment that they get return on, I am more in the camp of uh, we should be funding projects that do some good in some way, shape, or form. And that good could simply be we want this an entrepreneur to be succeed so they can create economic wealth for themselves and for their family. Or we just want to see this product exist, whether it's profitable or not, or we believe that this technology is going to be super impactful and could really change the world and not just like be another cool gadget. And so m my perception is a little bit different than what we think of traditionally about venture capitalists. I think we, I think we need to disrupt that model. I think there's still a place for that. But what I see is that because this group is seen, this underfunded and underrepresented founders like myself are seen as a potential risk to eliminate that risk is not seeing people as a as a money opportunity. Like the only reason I'm helping you out is because this is a future money opportunity for me. I want that to go away in this context, or at least create a new ecosystem around that. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's that's fantastic. I love that. But you know, the Brown Venture Group. I'm talking to Chris. Yeah, we've we've been in. They've had a you know, they have like gods and gods business plans that have been sent their way. Obviously, they're smaller than the world practically around yeah. black and brown tech ventures. But yeah. I'm sure there's plenty of Minnesota, you know, proposals in their in their bucket that you know may or may not you know succeed there. But yeah. Right, right, and and you know they're 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 not a pre you know they're not pre seed. They're definitely like you need to have revenue. You have to be have active customers. Um, but yeah, Chris has been very interested in this project um, as well. For, so thanks for calling them out. All right, thank y'all. Thank you. Oh wait, sorry, one more. <laughs> sorry. No, you're fine. Um, so I just want to 
say thanks because not everybody has a place like this to come and speak and represent other people. Um, being a, a person of non-color and always trying to figure out how to make it better for everybody, it's really hard to be a white woman when there's so much shit going on and you want to be helpful. So um, you stepped in the right place at the right time. And I think that what we're seeing is this evolution of the old Everything has to be a buck. Everything's rated by how much it's bringing in. It's changing. Our kids are changing. They know that if we don't put the time and energy and effort into it, it's gonna be really bad for everybody. And as far as Minnesota and growth, our growth is our people of color. Our growth is the, the people that have different views and ideas because that's a big chunk of our population. And if the investors don't want to pay attention to that, they're losing out, they're losing money. So if we want our state to be profitable and more rich, we have to go the direction that you're talking about. Yeah. So I thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. And to follow up on that, I think there's there's several examples, especially black and brown founders of color. And I'll speak to the like at Sid Technologies, our our founder is moving to Washington D.C. because she just can't she can't stand being here in this ecosystem anymore. Um, and the same thing happened with Clarence at Upsy moving to Dallas. Like th that, we 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 are we're already losing. Um, we're already losing founders that have seen success because they just can't continue to navigate this sort of toxic ecosystem. And you're and you're totally right. Like, um, it's not just being in the business space, right? Either, right. right. It's, it's the broader community. Clarence had some really bad experiences that had nothing to do with business. Yep. That are about the racism that exists in our community, and we have to bring that into this report as well. Yep. Yeah. For sure. I mean, there was an article in the Star Tribune not that long ago talking about this. Yep. It's like, how do you how do you attract and keep these people in our community? How do you raise up the people that are in our community? How do you encourage the kids that grow up in this community to stay? Yeah. And I think that's all really cool stuff. Yeah. So congratulations. Thanks. Congratulations is to everyone who's like out there grinding it. <laughs> so thanks everyone. Thanks for. Thanks for coming today and for your support and your questions.